the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center and Understanding Evolution, this is the Evolution in the News story for May 2009. I'm Kristen Jenkins. As the climate warms, plants and animals are faced with rapidly changing environmental conditions. Species survival depends on the ability to adjust to these changes. Such changes can be in behavior, such as a plant flowering later or birds laying eggs earlier, morphology, say a larger or smaller adult body size, or physiology, for example, the ability to tolerate higher temperatures. One way for this to happen is through the evolutionary process of adaptation. This process requires advantageous mutations to arise and several generations for the trait to become common in the population. Another way for this to happen is through phenotypic plasticity. Phenotypic plasticity allows individuals to adjust their behavior, morphology, or physiology based on environmental cues. Some species have evolved more phenotypic plasticity than others, and these are the species that may have a better chance of surviving in a rapidly changing environment. In order to make good decisions about regulating greenhouse emissions or for conservation planning, we need to understand how organisms deal with changing environments, whether they will respond through adaptation or through phenotypic plasticity. Dr. George Gilchrist, a professor of biology at the College of William and Mary, is an evolutionary biologist investigating this question. Uh, my name is George Gilchrist. I'm a uh, evolutionary biologist at the College of William and Mary. I study how organisms adapt to a changing climate. I'm interested in all sorts of timescales, uh, from daily change to seasonal change to the kinds of global climate changes that we are seeing right now throughout, uh, throughout the world. What is the difference between an adaptation and acclimating? What does phenotypic plasticity have to do with this? So let's use an example from my research to talk about this difference between an acclimatory or plastic response and an evolved or adaptive response. It's been known for a long time that for most organisms, but particularly for insects, if you grow up larvae in a cold environment, as adults, they'll reach a, high, a larger body size than if you grow up the larvae in a warm environment. These could be genetically identical populations. It's strictly a phenotypic response, and it's a plastic response. Temperature affects, temperature during development, affects adult body size when the adults eclose. We can see a, a similar parallel response as an evolved adaptation across latitudinal gradients. Animals from low latitude warm populations, say Southern California, are smaller in body size than animals in the same species from high latitude populations, say British Columbia. This difference though is not just a plastic response, this is a genetic difference. If we take those animals into what we call a common garden experiment, as we bring them into the lab and we rear them for multiple generations under identical conditions, the ones from the high latitude population are always larger than the ones from the low latitude population. That shows it's a genetic difference, not a plastic difference. What other factors influence the impact of climate change on species? One of the things that you have to appreciate about climate change is that there's a geographical component, both to the predicted changes from the climate modelers and to the geographic structure of natural populations. Most of us who've re read the news about this are probably aware that the predictions are, and in fact the data shows, that high latitudes, the Arctic and polar areas, 
will undergo much more dramatic warming and are undergoing much more dramatic warming than other parts of the globe. These, of course, are home to a unique group of animals, things like penguins, polar bears, uh, ice fish, uh, a wide variety of organisms that can't live in warmer climates, that are adapted genetically to these cold habitats. You probably have seen in the news that there's concern about polar bears shrinking habitat. Polar bears hunt on ice uh, for seals, and as sea ice disappears, essentially their hunting grounds are melting away. And it's not clear from an ecological standpoint what polar bears are going to do. One might hope that they can acclimate to this new situation this is using phenotypic plasticity to somehow switch their diet or their hunting style either to hunt seals in a very different way or to use some other resource that doesn't require sea ice in order to access it. That would be an acclimatory change or a phenotypically plastic change in the way polar bears behave that would allow their populations to persist. What we don't know right now is whether they have that ability or not. Right now, polar bears generally hunt seals on sea ice, and we don't know if they have any plasticity in that behavior. How do species respond to climate change? What we know from history, from the fossil record, is that in the past when the climates change, populations of organisms, be they plants or animals, essentially get up and move. In a warming world, populations move towards the poles and towards higher altitudes. In a cooling world, they move from the poles towards the equator and down from the mountaintops to lower altitudes. In our world, a warming world, there's important considerations about the options that are available to certain groups of organisms. For example, in a warming world, a polar organism really doesn't have a cooler climate that it can move to. An organism that lives, say, at the mid-latitudes, something like in Nebraska or uh, South Dakota, can move north if it needs colder habitat. As, as Nebraska and South Dakota begin to warm. An organism in the Bering Strait or at the Arctic Circle really has nowhere to go. There's no colder climate available. So those organisms have to adapt genetically or acclimate phenotypically to those changing conditions. If organisms can get up and move to better climates, why is climate change a problem for anything except organisms already living at the coldest extremes? Another example, much more subtle, are the tropics. Immediately north or south of the tropics, it gets hotter, not cooler. The tropics are warm, but not that warm. Temperatures tend to average in the mid-20s, most of the time in the tropics, and there's very little temperature variation seasonally. Tropical organisms don't have a cooler habitat they can move to, even though the tropics aren't expected to warm very much. There's nowhere to go, because if you go north or south, you're immediately going to encounter more desert-like and hot conditions. Because of the constancy of conditions in the tropics, Organisms have evolved relatively narrow ranges of thermal tolerance. They never see extremely hot weather or extremely cold weather. Therefore, there's been no natural selection for organisms to be able to persist under those conditions. Likewise, because organisms don't see a lot of variation within their lifetimes, there's very little selection for acclimation ability. They have very low phenotypic plasticity. So small changes in the tropics are actually expected to have much more dramatic rate effects on rates of extinction 
than our changes at higher latitudes, simply because tropical organisms are so specialized for the conditions that they see. How did you become interested in evolutionary biology? You know, probably like a lot of the students out there, when I was in high school, I really didn't have a lot of interest in science. In fact, I didn't even have a lot of interest in school. And uh, so when I graduated from high school, I went to work. And I worked for a number of years before going to college. And even when I went back to college, I went back as a English major because I couldn't think of anything else really to do. And uh, I just, you know, in order to fulfill my distribution requirements, I took a, an intro biology class. And there was something about that class and the teacher that just really struck me and uh, changed my whole life. Uh, you know, I took more biology classes, and it was actually in my sophomore year in a class in invertebrate zoology. I think it was like the 27th of September or something like that. And it was a lecture on the evolution of sex, of all things. And it was in that class I was so fascinated by what I was hearing about this question of why is it that organisms engage in recombination, that is that males and females combine their gametes to create a new genotype, why don't they just reproduce clonally and transmit 100% of their genetic material to their offspring? That seems so obvious the best thing to do from a natural selection standpoint. It makes no sense why you would mix up your genes. I found that whole question so interesting that um, I went and saw the professor right after class and uh, asked him if anyone did any work on that at that university. The answer was no. So then I said to the professor, okay, well, what do you work on? And uh, I started working in his lab and uh, went on to graduate school and so on. For more information about this story, including links to primary and popular literature and classroom resources, visit the National Evolutionary Synthesis Center website or the Understanding Evolution website. More stories are available in the Evolution in the News archives on either site. The National Evolutionary Synthesis Center is funded by the National Science Foundation to promote research in biological evolution.